welcome mamta it's fantastic to have you on my show of 100 women of impact it's been amazing to know you and the work which you have done um just for our viewers mamta saikya is the ceo of bharti foundation and she is not only managing one of the largest philanthropic effort in the education space but she is also one of the beacon for a lot of women like us especially who have transitioned from corporate careers to the impact space thank you so much mamta for joining us it's really my uh, privilege sarika uh, to be part of your series and um, like you were telling me that you are covering women from various uh, you know uh, streams be it uh, actors or writers so it really is my privilege sarika so thank you so much mamta so thank you so much mamta mamta without much ado i'll just jump into your uh, career journey and it has always been very fascinating to know Uh, what you studied and there are many young viewers as well you studied bsc physics then you went and did your management then you started your career as a consultant and then later on landed up as a impact professional i mean could you tell me about the different choices you made which are all very diverse and varied and possibly not connected or seemingly not so connected or what made you do all that so sarika i come from a family of educationists and uh, my father was very keen so he himself is a um, so he's he's a doctor in statistics statistics he's got a theorem to his name so for him and also my mother education was a key thing right and uh, my father was very keen um, that i should take up science and i should either try for engineering or something like that my mother was a teacher in a government school she was a counselor come teacher english teacher father was in ncert educationist again so i um, i told them i'm very fascinated by this mba course and whatever i'm hearing mba was very expensive and my father was a professor so of course uh, financial constraint was a, a, a big part of the decision that we're taking so my father said fine you do your mba and that's why i've done msc only for one year he said first you show me that you can get admission in bet course of cie that uh, cie that's in delhi university so no i'll do msc uh, and anyway i've got admission so if i have to get into teaching line then i'll do it after msc i'll take bet test again so i cleared the bet which gave me the permission to try for mbas next year and then i got into imt and um, and uh, cried to my father he broke his pf account and everything uh, you know for my education now when i finished my mba having a science background my initial consultancy was in power sector you know but uh, steam turbines you know rice husk utilization um i did that work for two years very exciting projects for the world bank for a radar uh, but you know something was not speaking to me i mean how many techno economic feasibility studies can you do for rice husk utilization and things like that and uh, and i remember one day i was walking up the stairs to the office it was on first floor and legs felt so heavy you know i just didn't feel like going to office connecting with me nothing was connecting with me you know and uh, then somewhere um I, i i then i started visiting ngos i think my father only suggested that if you're not liking this job see if you can so he believes in it he says that if your pen and your ink cannot change somebody's life uh, then it is not worth studying you know what so use your skills sense. and yeah so that's what he said so um in 1992 and suddenly i saw an ad by cry in those days it was child relief and you today it is child rights and you that ad was for a marketing specialist to raise funds right and it was almost like god has answered my prayers i had left the job um and within a month this ad came and it was like it was using my skills so i i i am not a social development person so i don't have to go into villages but i am a storyteller right and now i can use my skills to actually raise funds that one ant and the trouble in the heart my my trouble in my heart that i want to do something meaningful it actually came together and it changed my life then i joined cry 
Uh, cry in those days was, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard of Cry Cards. Uh, so Cry used to sell cards to raise funds. It was one of the yes, very well respected. Yes. I remember picking up those Cry Cards and giving Christmas and New Year greetings on that. Feeling good exactly. that I've done my bit. <laughs> <laughs> you're still doing your bit education as long as we are in education we're every day we are changing lives so i joined cry for their direct mail cell for which they had received funding uh, from one of the funding agencies amanda my next question is on what do you think is the biggest or what do you think could be the biggest motivating factor and the skills needed to thrive and join in the impact sector because a lot of people like you said uh, you had not done masters in uh, uh, social work msw but yet you found your space over here but it does require a little different kind of a temperament and attitude and skills and competencies to not only um, join the sector but also thrive in the sector what do you think what would you suggest to people who want to make this transition just two things one as a belief other as an attitude right um anybody who wants to join the impact sector so you have to be very clear that you believe in it because especially if you're making a shift from corporate sector it will not have the perks a that you are used to b it will never have the kind of if you're coming from a big corporate the kind of budgets the kind of spends that you are used to it will never have that spend approach to money is different right right so what that means is if your belief then i'm here to make sure that my life has a meaning i'm here to make sure that every step that i take every word that i write every decision that i take every minute that i spend has to have a meaningful impact if that belief is not very strong then there will be a everyday struggle in this right. sector so first is belief be very clear that you will face challenges and i love you will have to go on going back inside of you and telling yourself why i am here and i'll tell you a story where my husband challenged me after this the second thing that i am seeing so badly missing and it's not true of only impact sector perhaps it's true of outside also is that everyday desire to learn people are not learning you cannot survive in this sector so you can't say i am in education and i know things about education you it's there is such a intersectionality to everything to a human being right your health impacts your education your father's economic status impacts your uh, education right so if you not and i'm saying not even that how many of development sector people have tried out chat gpt they won't have tried out chat gpt right are we keeping up with technology are we mm -hmm. figuring out and we don't have to depend on other people there's so many free versions go try out learn read follow right kind of handles on twitter right even if something has not come to india something some cutting edge technology globally thing in the us you have to know about it right you have to listen to people who think differently than you and i am seeing that that desire to learn diminishing we say that this young generation is very social media savvy but they are making reels and things like that are they learning and investing in themselves that desire to learn is diminishing that's what worries me that's such a wonderful story thank you so much for sharing you know i i personally feel do you think there's something specifically lacking you have been working in the space of education and children and rights for such a long time do you think there is something specifically lacking in our country in the education space um and when i say lacking in terms of the will the intent or the systems or the processes and how can we make it better what do you think this one thing if we had it in our control we should make this better immediately i i won't say that there is any lack of will intent or even initiatives you know uh, i find uh, at times it becomes very easy uh, to criticize government right but i not only that i've seen my father working being part of ncrt and stuff and i've seen and he was uh, he was part of the data unit and all the education census and things like that and i've seen the commitment the intelligence 
uh, you know, thanks to him, I got exposed to a lot of work that was, you know, to meet his colleagues, to hear drawing room conversations of things that are being planned. And even now in my work, I have met exceptional bureaucrats, a committed people, right? And there are a lot of innovations that are also happening. Uh, and there are some very good innovations that are that can be very easily scaled up. Hmm. Correct. Uh, I just believe that, and that is something you know, being part of Bharti Foundation. I'm telling you. So you can say I'm the lead administrator for Bharti Foundation schools, right? Here is here is an HR department that comes with its own processes of this is how we will interview. This is how. Uh, 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 test would happen where teachers, potential teachers will give tests and there'll be a demo, then there'll be this. For demo, we want trainers to come in. We want operations people to come in. So HR has its own set of processes. Material supply people have their own set of processes. Finance has its own set of processes. Our training and curriculum unit has its own set of processes. Program operations has its own set of processes. At the end, it is the school head teacher and teachers. Hmm. They have to make it work. All processes are falling into their onto their head, right? This learning came to me after having run Satya Bharti schools for seven, eight years. You see, initially your processes are being cooked up slowly, slowly. We had almost 100 set of mini, micro, medium, large processes. And it is so unfair to expect it. Now there is this team of uh, teachers and principals who would while giving education, their prime job is education, right? They will also look at these processes. So one thing that we did in Bharti Foundation was every year there was a committee of operations people who would sit down and cut down on processes. Mm -hmm. Okay, not only in numbers. So questioning is this process adding mm -hmm. any value to the final goal or is it only for a reassurance? We also check it out, is it not happening, right? At the end of the day, it has to lead to some change, na? correct? Reassurances would only be five points. What are those key reassurances we want? Everything cannot be reassurance. Every breath that a teacher takes, you don't want a reassurance for that. So this is now an annual exercise where we look at our process universe from the position of a teacher and a principal to see what is the load that we are putting on to them. Yeah, at the end of the day, processes are meant to ultimately make the task easier. If it only makes the task more cumbersome and more rigid and inflexible, then the process itself is not working that means. And, so and people like us, you know, who sit in administrative position, uh, we love creating processes. I'm in that position totally. myself. Totally. So till this time, we it only you. don't say, yeah. yeah till the time it hits you. My next question to you is, and this has kind of perturbed me, Mamta, is that the, the giving sector and the impact sector, both the philanthropic sector as a whole, in the US has been very prolific. They have done extremely well. They are large institutions, large uh, collective philanthropic efforts as well. Uh, whereas in India, you know, it has always had initially, it's getting better, of course. Initially it had the Jhora Latkai charitable work kind of a thing and which did not attract the right talent at times, which does not attract the right donors at times because it created a bad name of money not being. What do you think we could do differently as a nation? To Because I personally believe not-for-profit sector, or I would say impact sector, I do not like the word not-for-profit, the impact sector can do so much more in India and it has so much of influencing power to cre you know, create, come up with some innovative solutions. What can we do things differently um, where we could also reach to a level where the citizens are taking the uh, jobs in their hand? They would want to get attracted to the sector. The young people would like to join the sector. What can we do differently? There has to be ample amount of rewards and recognition. See, in countries like the US and UK, charity sector, even in Singapore now, uh, there are a lot of structures around charity sector and our country also has them. So that's not somewhere, uh, you know, as far as structures and policies are concerned. They're evolving. Every country evolves. Uh, but reward and recognition is something that, you know, we're not very good at appreciating the work that is being done. Bring it up because, you know, it's very yeah. easy 
for the uh, you know things which are not good any sector will have things which are not good sure not good things become a story but good things are not becoming a story so, so i know true. that uh, nexus for good is trying to do the same thing but we all have to kind of come together and play our role in that and this brings down to my uh, one of the last question is what is that advice you would give to the youth who wants to join the sector and wants to be a part of the community service what what would you advise them uh i think what i said initially be very so there are two two routes any any young person can take one is joining this joining this sector fully mm -hmm. right and if they want to do it they must take up a professional course so that they they are kind of taken through the process of rigor training experience practicals etc but not everyone can take that life decision it is a life decision the path that you take right so i believe that even if every person who even if you are in a corporate life even if you have your own business you are a musician right there's always a part of us that can contribute to this sector that can give back find that, yeah find that part so what you can do you must do right mm -hmm. if you're if you're doing uh 25 concerts you know in a year mm -hmm. why can't one or two concerts be for a Very charity funds for charity okay? do it so if we all start following that one good deed a day uh, we'll find something or the other and this world would be such a better uh, such a better place to be in so we all don't have to give up our careers but every day morning when you get up you say okay while i'll do my work today what is that one thing that and that one thing for today could be cutting a check because i believe um, uh, this is a good charity and they are doing something very good for what is happening right tomorrow it could be helping somebody with work because you know that person is struggling so i think we just have to bring back our you know some of the old practices when we were in in the school thank you so much amamta for this candid conversation really appreciate it and um, we we believe that the audience will also be very happy to hear your conversation thank you so much for joining us thank you thank you so much